Hello again. Um, so I'm going to um, introduce my panel, my panel right away. <clears throat> it's been quite a long day, a lot of uh, information. So what I'm proposing to do right now is to do a little traveling. So I'm going to call um, Munia, Donato, and uh, Jordi. Kishi, Vengan. Um, take a seat. And uh, we are going to travel because we're going to uh, talk about uh, emerging market, uh, more specifically application of Health 2.0 solutions in emerging markets. Um, actually, um, Jordi, if you join me on this one, um, and Donato, um, also, well, I don't want to leave you alone, but we need to leave some space. Let's leave some space at some point for uh, the, the people who are going to, uh, so just get closer to, you. to demo the solutions. Um, so Matthew briefly talked on the fact that um, Health 2.0 uh, had a, a partnership with the AFC called Take Emerge. Um, and he, he didn't mention that, but um, the Tech Emerge was actually funding company up to uh, one million dollars. Uh, to pilot um, in India. And the reason is that emerging market, there may be the markets where these Health 2.0 um, solution might have the <laughs> biggest impact um, on, on uh, population's health. So um, to discuss this topic, um, I have with me Munya uh, Chivaza, who is coming. Um, did you arrive from Germany or from, uh, uh, today from Kenya? From, from, from Germany. <laughs> oh, OK. Um, so he's in charge of the accelerator program um, at the Merck Innovation Center, uh, and he's involved in outreach activities and in supporting the uh, incubated um, projects. Um, Munya, the, the Merck Accelerator has two locations, um, Darnstadt and Nairobi. That's right. Interesting choices. Um, do you want to uh, explain a little bit what was the, the vision um, in creating these, uh, these two locations? Yeah, sure. So um, Merck is, is a, a science and technology company that's, that's focused on healthcare, life science, and performance materials. And we are, our headquarters is in Darmstadt. So when we decided to build an innovation center, the natural place was the headquarters where everyone is. Um, the accelerator program came out of this innovation center, which was uh, which which came about to 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 bring a sort of new culture of entrepreneurship and innovation in everything that we do at Merck. Uh, so the accelerator program was focused on supporting entrepreneurs um, in in the line of businesses that we that, that that we currently have at Merck in the healthcare, life sciences, and and performance materials. Uh, Nairobi was a bit more interesting as a choice uh, because this is. So Africa, since 2014, has become a focus area for, for, for Merck as a company, um, and especially when it comes to healthcare. Uh, one of the things that the group leadership, so the Merck leadership had uh, a visit uh, into, into Africa in 2015, and one of the things that they, they sort of decided was that in order for us um, to reach some of the goals that we've set ourselves, which is sort of 20, by 2020, we should double the revenue, double the, the, uh, the actual labor force that we have in, in Africa. We needed to get good partners and good collaborations. Um, and some of the things that were, that were challenging us uh, were issues about access. Uh, and for us, it was a natural reach to sort of look at mobile, uh, so the mobile penetration in the, in the area, to look at the digital startups that were coming up, that, okay, in digital healthcare, there's something there that will solve many of the access and availability issues that we are facing. Uh, but we didn't have the partners. So we okay. started looking at entrepreneurs, and the Accelerator program was born through that. All right, the second person that I'd like to introduce on this panel, and by the way, my team just reminded me that um, there is also a session running in parallel to this one um, that is about uh, the role of Health 2.0 technologies transforming uh, the duties of nurses, and this session is downstairs. Um, little break. Um, so the second person I wanted to introduce um, is the uh, founder of Universal Doctor, Jordi Serrano Pons. 
Um, so Universal Doctor is a suite of digital health apps to facilitate multilingual communication between healthcare professionals and patients that don't necessarily speak the same language. Um, so we showcased uh, this application of, like two or three years ago. It's, yeah, uh, many times. Thank I mean, you. in digital health years, it's, uh, it's like centuries. Yes. Um, and um, since then, you've been working on a lot of different um, projects in Africa um, and um, in, uh, in emerging markets, and you've also become um, a consultant uh, to the WHO. Um, so we wanted to have, if the technical team can uh, bring the slide up, um, Jordi, you wanted to uh, share uh, a, a few words about two recent projects. Um, yeah. One was about Zika and... Yeah, one... thank you very much. Um, Universal Doctor was born for that, to tackle the multilingual problem. Uh, we did, I suppose, quite well, because slowly we have become a hub of improving healthcare communication, and precisely we have been able to partner with WHO to make apps, and we launched uh, some weeks ago the Zika app, and we did that app in just three weeks, which in terms of WHO, it's so, so fast with these international organizations. It's been a super success. We have updated it five, six times. We are in the version 1.6 right now. And it's good because we have been able to embed it in the workflow of the organization. Objective, targeting healthcare workers with offline information, which is very good because it's updated constantly. No? Not only that, but we also believe that we had to, because we believe in doing social good, will give you good business also, no? And we also, uh, we couldn't stand uh, apart from the refugee crisis. With all our multilingual tools, we had to do something, and we gave all the tools for free, especially to the German government and other, other institutions in Germany. Um, and basically, it was a success, because many hospitals call us to implement the version, and we learn a lot again, and we could do a little bit of good. Finally, some weeks ago, uh, we launched an app uh, called Zero Mothers Die, in the context of an NGO that we launched some years ago um, for reducing maternal mortality. Again, communication with women, with mothers, with midwives. We are learning a lot. Because of all that, we have been awarded some different projects with the London, Tropical London School uh, and many other projects. So our convincement that doing good makes also good business is it's stronger, no? And I, uh, and I, I want to uh, emphasize that, no? Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Um, so we have a great panel. We're going to watch uh, four demos um, together, and I want you three to um, feel free to react, interact, ask questions of the demoers. And then we're going to start with our first demo, Jean. Uh, do you want to go and... Uh, while I introduce you? Um, so Jean is going to showcase a solution called X-Rapid. It's an iPhone app uh, using a cutting-edge digital imaging technology and um, artificial intelligence to diagnose diseases such as malaria and tuber tuberculosis um, in a fast, inexpensive, and accurate way. Yes, thank you. The floor is yours. Good afternoon. Um, for the demo, I'm going to use a portable microscope. We can use a very big one, but this one should do. Uh, two years ago, our head of technology used uh, filters developed for the metal industry on malaria slides because he lives in Jakarta. He realized he could teach uh, with an artificial engine um, an iPhone to read a slide to look at each red blood cell, each white blood cell to find parasites. Within six months, we had a working model. Within nine months, we were in the field in Papua New Guinea. So I'm going to straightforward go. Sorry. No, can we put, can we have this on? I'm going to show you the screen of the phone. It's going to be faster. OK. Uh, it should work. Here we go. Um, so what we're looking at here, yes, sorry, is um, it's, a thin, it's called thin film. It's just a, a bit of blood on a, on a plate, and uh, we're reading it through the camera of the iPhone. 
Um, we've told the iPhone, I don't know if you can see it. Yeah. Uh, all those are uh, red blood cells. Yes. Um, we've told the iPhone through a mix of digital image processing, artificial intelligence, and, um, and face recognition uh, software to um, differentiate between all the stages of, of malaria and all the different um, red blood cells, all the different white blood cells that you can, that you can find. And I'm going to do a, a full diagnostic in front of you. Um, here we go. We're going to go through 10 slides quite quickly. The numbers you see on the top right are all the different stages of, um, of the disease that he's finding. We're going to go straight to the end. And here we go. Here we go. Um, so what we've just done in less than 40 seconds um, used to take, or still takes, 30 minutes for someone to do, by, um, to do um, himself. Um, it's more reliable, it's faster, it's extremely cheap, it's deployable anywhere. I mean, no, normally there's no cable. There's, you can take it anywhere. Um, it can read every single uh, uh, type of malaria, there's five of them. And as we were uh, running it in Borneo with the London School of Tropical Medicine, we tried it on tuberculosis. And we told the machine to look for something else, to look for a different kind of, uh, of not bacteria, but bacillium. And uh, within a week, we had a system that could read 60%, then 70%, then 90%. And we just reached 99%. It's not blood, it's uh, sputum, but it's uh, the same principle. Um, we've started trials on gonorrhea, on syphilis, uh, because they're all endemic, usually in the countries where we have malaria. But the last and, and and then I thought, uh, let's do. We've done something for the rest of the world. Let's let's do something for myself. I, I'm a patient. Uh, I have an autoimmune disease. I lost my kidneys four years ago, and uh, I was transplanted in 2012. In 2012, I went 113 times to give my blood just to check my white and red blood cells. And we're just starting work on a red blood count and white blood count system that you can do at home using, using X-Rapid directly on the system that you're seeing here. And it should be the future of what we do, hopefully. And I'm straight into the stop sign. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, Join us, but before we, um, we watch uh, our next demo, I'd like to uh, introduce our third uh, panelist um, who's coming um, from the US to, uh, to come and join us today. Uh, Donato Tremuto is the CEO of Wellbeing Improvement Leader Healthways. Um, he's the uh, founder and former CEO of Physicians Interactive, now known as Aptus Health. Uh, but also, um, Donato founded in uh, 2011 Healthy Villages, a nonprofit that provides mobile health technology in challenging clinical environment. Um, and we're going to watch a short video in a moment. Um, but I wanted to uh, maybe uh, give you the say opportunity, Donato, to say a few Perfect. words to introduce what we're going to see. Perfect. Good afternoon, it's a pleasure to be here. Five years ago, I was on a plane heading to Europe from the US, and I read a article, the content of which is still etched in my mind today, and that is, in our lifetime, one billion people will go to their graves prematurely because they never had access to a healthcare worker. Six million are children who die each year because they have no access to clean water and medication. Some people have said to me that that's not our problem. I disagree. Article 25 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says that healthcare is a basic right for every single person. And when one person has not had access to that right, we have violated the declaration. And so in 2000... <laughs> In 2011, rather than innovate, I decided we would integrate. And we took 
from the commercial company that I started, Physicians Interactive, we took their medical app and brought it over to Healthy Villages. And we went into emerging communities. And one example is in a small village in East Africa, Lawala. In 2012, infant mortality was 100 deaths per 1,000 births. By bringing our medical app and training the local villagers, just because you are poor does not mean you don't have an intellect. We trained the local villagers how to use the medical app. They're the ones that identified, they identified the pregnant mothers in the community. They brought them into their homes. They identified who might be at high risk. Today, infant mortality is 30 deaths per 100 births. 70 more babies are alive today per 1,000 births. 98% of the moms-to-be now deliver their babies in a community health center. In 2012, it was less than 25%. I can share more statistics with you here today, but let's watch the video. I think the actual video really supports the work that Healthy Villages is doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. ...as an organization that is focused on providing the technology and supportive means to allow organizations to deliver and honor their vision. For me, what Healthy Villages is, essentially it's a medical library in a portable package. It can be transformative. And I've seen that with my own eyes. Really, it's a technology-enabled solution where we're using these digital devices to help connect the healthcare provider to the information they need, but also to their patient and ultimately even to the community. For me, Healthy Villages is about connecting people in a way that is neighborly. The technology itself, because it's mobile, because it reaches people where they are, is helping to connect so many of us who work at the edges of poverty and global health and make sure that we are a part of a larger community of those who are trying to do good but often need more support. It's a whole library in one thing. It's not me trying to drag textbooks everywhere. So I have the whole world right here. I like that. We have quick access to information, especially for our nurse educators. It's easier having a, a little screen and have that patient one-on-one, -on -one, like a postpartum patient, a mom that just delivered a baby. Watch this video about what signs and symptoms that you know when a baby's getting sick. So it's not when they're coming to the hospital for this acute situation. Like Teresa here, we're, we brought her from South Sudan all the way to Kenya, and we're going to teach her for 18 months. But now she's going to go back and she's going to be all by herself. So she's going to have these mothers come that are dying, or small children that need surgery, and she may have questions. She may have to be reminded of some of the things that she's been taught, and having access to any device that will save the lives of the women of South Sudan and the children is well worth a small amount of money. I use it all the time for checking drug dosages and interactions. You're going to take two tablets, and then in an hour, you'll take another tablet. OK. OK. Just one more tool in the toolbox. One of the nurses was dealing with a pregnant mother. She had come in because she had a headache. When we took her blood pressure, it was through the roof. It was actually unreadable. We were worried about preeclampsia. We were trying to think through the dosage of magnesium sulfate, and we couldn't find a drug index anywhere in the hospital, and we were able to look up the correct dosage. I don't treat for high potassium levels every day, and this patient had very high levels of potassium, and this was fatal. But just looking at the device, I was able to get everything that I'm supposed to get, and the patient was helped. What Healthy Villages means to me is really an opportunity to heal the villages. There are some challenges that we all face, but then there are also some challenges that are at a local level, and understanding that we may have some technology-enabled solutions and a unique talent to collaborate with others and connect that we might be able to help engage and make a difference in the lives of others. Now, we're not going to solve all the world's problems, we understand that, but if we can have a positive impact on one life, that has to be good enough for us. While I recognize I will never change the world in my lifetime, what I can do is move forward the needle a little bit. That is what Healthy Village's success is all about. So I, th I think, Donato, you'll, you'll find a lot of synergies um, with the, uh, the, the next demo that we're going to see. But I want to go back first um, to what we just um, witnessed as a demo. 
Um, did you have any um, thoughts about that uh, malaria diagnosing um, tool? And then, yeah. Munya, if you want to jump in too. But. Yeah, what struck me, first of all, um, my congratulations and compliments. As you know, um, malaria in these areas is a very, very big concern. But I say to you that what I've learned here is not about innovation anymore. It's about inter integration. And I say that because so many young people that are going through their own kind of perspective of what they can contribute to healthcare believe that it's about innovation. And so how do we take what you're doing and integrate it in a way in the platforms that are already there? And let me give you a great case example. In Kajabi a few years ago, they were using our Healthy Villages medical app. But what we learned is that in the various villages, the dialect is different. And so while we were certainly providing the information in English, what we learned is that nobody was really gathering any information. And so what we did is we partnered with another company that was able to provide a slideshow on top of our app in the language that was specific to the community. And so my only kind of you know, ask of yourself is, how do you integrate this at the point of care so that it's not confusing for the clinician and for the provider? I'll give you a, an example. We're in uh, Papua, Indonesia. Uh, it's as remote as it can be. Um, we delivered to an NGO, an NGO being two South African Kiwis uh, working there for the last 20 years. And we have a small patient management system for when to, just to check that when he comes back, he, he's treated correctly. And, um, and we had name, first name. Then we realized there is no name. There is no first name. Mm. It's a sound, and you can't write it. Uh, and we had to go back to the drawing board and put a picture, because the only thing that worked is a picture. Um, so the picture came back, <laughs> and <coughs> most of our patients are under fives. Uh, as you know, malaria kills mostly uh, the, the, the youngsters. And in Papua, they don't name, they don't name children under five. Uh, and pictures of children were uh, difficult because two, two children can look the same. So we redesigned it so a children would be defined by the picture of the two parents. Yes. Uh, and that was his, his medical file. That was the picture of his two parents. Uh, and I'll just add to that, and for those of you in the audience here, is that, and you probably have seen this, that for the clinicians, it's important that they have options. In this community in Lawala, what we learned is they had no cell technology. And so I picked the phone up and I called the CEO of Vodafone and said, you and I are gonna put a cell tower up. And we ended up putting the cell tower, in this case of malaria, is that one of the clinicians was unable to make the diagnosis. But the fact that they were able to Skype the picture over to Vanderbilt and get a diagnosis, even though the child did not live, for that clinician, the ability to have that opportunity to provide an option went a long way to satisfying that they were able to do everything. And that's why I say what you're doing, I think, is incredible, because at the end, the clinician wants to feel like they've done something. Even if the outcome is not what they wanted, they did something to really advance. In your film, you talk about South Sudan. Uh, we have a very specific example. We work with Toto in Tanzania on, on, on inshore and offshore platforms. They pay, don't tell anyone, $220 each time they try, each time they test their workers. In South Sudan, we charge one cent. Mm. For exactly the same app, exactly the same, uh, as long as Toto doesn't know it, it's fine. And, uh, and that's, I think, how we, we have to adapt what we do to, to where we are. Well, and what I have learned is that the higher your collaborative IQ, the more you can get done. And you've got to flex. And at times you're going to have to partner with organizations that um, you may have to push your theory of the business to the side and partner with them. And so the higher your collaborative IQ, the more you can get done. And it sounds like you're practicing that Oh, completely. Um, we're not a social company, but we act as if, um, just because you can't. Also, we run on a pay-per-use basis, so you buy a thousand tests. And then we suddenly realized we couldn't stop. Hmm. At the thousand one, thousand and one tests, what, you're not going to diagnose the kid who just came? It just doesn't work. 
so we just keep on going and we sort it out, we sort it out later. Um, Munya, yeah. you, you do have a specific interest in, uh, in malaria, right? Did you want to, um, to comment on the... Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, it's, it's quite interesting because we have a portfolio company at the moment in, in Darmstadt, basically, that's, that's also working on malaria, malaria diagnostics. Um, they're from Uganda. And they found that it's pretty difficult to get people to extract blood uh, in order to test. So they're trying to do a non-invasive uh, diagnostic tool. Um, how has it been for you in, in Papua New Guinea? Uh, we had to change completely. First, when it was first developed, obviously we needed a line okay. which didn't work. And we had to, uh, we were working with the London School of Tropical Medicine. We had to redevelop an entire protocol on, on pricking the finger and, and and the heel for, 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 for kids. Uh, and then when they spread it on, on, on the slate, they never do it the right way, so we had to do a simple thing, so they could swipe on it. Uh, and then the dips, there's, you know, there's blue dye. We told them to put drops, it didn't work. So we, we made like a, like a bucket where they, where they count to five. One, two, three, four, five, and then they draw it like this. So you have to adapt to, to all situations. Just the last question: How, 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 how is the accuracy based um, in comparison to the traditional ways of? of oh, um, we won't be we won't be PCR or very expensive stuff or fluorescence or stuff like that. But um, it's ninety nine point five point six, so way above what you would have in the field normally, uh, even with a trained microscopist. That's All good. right. Well, thank you, Jean, and Welcome. congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we're we're going to um, call our next um, demo speaker. Uh, Juan Sebastián Suárez Valencia, um, if he's ready, he's right here, he was hiding, um, and he's going to uh, introduce uh, Breast Healthcare, um, it's a collaboration tool that allows nurses, um, in the example that you're going to take, in Sierra Leone, to work with physicians from all, around, all over the world. Um, yeah. So, let's, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. So, um, I, w I have a few seconds to put into context this app. So this is an app that um, was created in a partnership with an ONG NGO called Soltis uh, for Sierra Leone. And uh, the context is that in Sierra Leone, there's 200 times less doctors than in France or in, uh, in Spain. So people that are taking care of the patients are what they call um, um, frontline health workers. So they're not nurses, but they're people that learn to use this app. So I will show you the interaction. So let's say that, for example, I'm a health worker. I'm going to see a patient who has HIV. So I fill uh, some information that I have from him. And then I can ask him some questions. This is important because uh, to, in order to uh, decide which molecule we have to give, we need to know if he takes his medication for some well, genetic barrier stuff. So this has visual cues for the patient. And if he, we do if the nurse or the health worker cannot speak the dialect of the patient, he can put the button so he can ask the patient directly, or even if it's not available, this language, he can see what he wants to answer. So let's say, for example, that he takes his medication. So we have integrated a smart algorithm inside the app that will tell the, the health professional, health well, worker, what he has to do, and it will explain why he has to do it. So that's what we call embedded learning, which improves the sustainability of the project because they learn while doing. So let's, for example, let's say that the compliance is not good. So let's say, for example, that he never takes his medication. In this case, so the algorithm considers that he needs the medical expertise. So let's, for example, let's say that we want to send this case to the doctor. Let's say yes. Yes. The internet is not really good here, so, so the, um, let's say, for example, let's say the information and um, the HIV, so they will ask a few questions to the patient to learn if he, uh, he has uh, the information that he needs to uh, treat his condition. So let's say, for example, that he answers, well, lock. So let's say, for example, that the patient needs a few information, and then at the end, the algorithm will decide which are the points that the patient doesn't understand about his own treatment, and he will propose some videos of some information 
to, uh, to help him to understand the disease and taking care of his health. So, let's first, so, so the information was sent to a health professional, some other place in the world. So I have my colleague my, uh, uh, the, my company there. So the, the doctor sees this information. So we have also visual cues that says that the patient has the HIV that is not controlled. So we have also the national guidelines. And let's say, for example, that I want to send a recommendation. So I want to give him this molecule because I consider that is the best decision. So I will send this to the health worker. So we go back to the health worker perspective. And when they open the app, there's a notification that says, for example, now we have the uh, decision for uh, the treatment of this patient. What is important to, to know about this is two things. First, that next time that the application has the same situation, he will learn from this information. And the second thing is that um, one month from there, from that moment, he will the application will ask him what was the decision for the case so we can see that he learned how to treat these patients. That's it. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, Jordi, that must uh, ring a bell? Yeah. Some, some reactions? Yeah. I suppose you are targeting um, healthcare workers as because in many countries, you know, there is a shortage of, of doctors, no? Yes. What is your idea there? Do uh, you want to target nurses, midwives? Or? Everyone. The problem with the, uh, the, the emerging countries is that um, with the conflicts now that we have in the, all over the world, we cannot take doctors in all the countries. And so in Brest, we call this, we're creating a digital humanitarian corridor. So we're bringing the information uh, to the places where we cannot go anymore. But this place to mobilize these persons or to teach them how to treat these patients, it costs a lot of money. So for example, let's say in Sierra Leone, it costs, for example, one, uh, one, uh, 11,000 euros to, uh, to teach someone how to treat this patient. But this person, he's a health worker now, but maybe he won't be in one month. So we'll lose this money. In this case, we just buy an app we'll, or buy a tablet, mm -hmm. and we can teach him, and we can continue to uh, take care of the patients. Have you taken into account the specificities? Because for the Mediterranean Initiative in the 70s, where there, there is a book where, where there is no doctor, no? Hesperian uh, High Guidelines, and many, many initiatives have been going on for many years. Right now, uh, USAID made an initiative empowering, and the problem is the localization, the many languages, and it's not the same a healthcare worker in Zambia, a healthcare worker in, in, in Senegal, no? Uh, the problem is the, problem. The, the issue is how to maintain at that side of the, 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 the doctors and healthcare workers on, on, on the office, because someone... You we, we work in a partnership with the NGOs that we work with, so we're constantly iterating uh, of the algorithms or how we, how we present the app. Yeah. So I, I, can't, I didn't show it, but we, we analyze what's bottom the, the, the professional, the health worker uses, what didn't, maybe he stopped at some point. So we analyze it and we'll say, for example, to the people that take care of this center. Uh, it's per, it's just to, to think where to invest the money in localizing it, making very specific, um, partnering with the government, or having always people available in the States here supporting the other people? Uh, just no, yeah. No, I, I think that the most important is that the, um, the the, the iteration with the, with the end user, which is the health worker. Of course, that we have many uh, tools that allow the governments to, to mm. see what is going on, how many patients have a resistant HIV. Mm. So we give, give tools to all of the um, managerial um, uh, personnel that is in these countries, yeah. to the health worker, to the uh, government, what is going on. They have dashboards to okay. see what is going on. So everyone is, is, uh, is Good. implicated. So let me ask you, so is this available then to the patients at all? Are the patients engaging with their mobile devices at all? No, no, no the patient doesn't. Uh, and, and why? We can do it, but the um, uh, internet is not available everywhere. So maybe we can use SMS or some interaction with the patient, but we cannot, we cannot give full responsibility to the patient to, to uh, handle this kind of problem. Because the resistance, for example, if the patient doesn't under what we do at the last, when we see what the patient understands about the disease, maybe allow us to 
give him some uh, empowerment. If he answers yeah. everything correctly, we can try to think. But at the beginning, we cannot. Uh, well, let me, and I think it's going to vary in different countries. What you have here to me is more of an engagement. And I think that you have to go more upstream and empower. It's not just about engagement. It's about empowerment. In the community that I had mentioned to you in Lawala, it's a community of 45,000 uh, villagers. 35% of them have HIV, but only 1,000 is diagnosed. Their problem is not compliance. Once they diagnose the individuals, they're engaged. But their problem is how do you get the other 30 Thousand. Yes, of course. Yeah, I, I, yes. Okay, and so I think there is an opportunity to integrate the empowerment engagement. My second point is, in a country like India, there's a population of 1.2 billion people. 45% don't have toilets. 65% have mobile phones. So I wouldn't disclaim, when we first went into this community, they didn't have the internet service, and then we got the tower up, and now everybody's using their mobile devices. I wouldn't disclaim, absolutely, that there's not going to be the ability to get that patient engaged through some mobile device. In areas where they don't have it, I think you're absolutely correct, but I think you're gonna find more and more of these areas have these, has the ability to have the, the I, connection. I, of course, I, I think that the technology that I showed is from wide side of uh, one perspective, but of course, even I am a physician, so of, I completely, uh, I know that the engagement and the empowerment of the patient is essential to have good outcomes. And uh, we can do it. The, the tools to do this kind of interaction is not the hard part. The hard part is hard, of course it's hard. But making an algorithm that works for different contexts, that's the, the hard uh, core of what, uh, but we can use tools to engage the patient. And this tool for HIV is one. We have another one for uh, tuberculosis where the, the engagement is, is also very important for, because, well, many reasons, so we work on that issue all the time. All right, well, thank you, Juan Sebastian. Um, we're going to, um, round of applause, sorry. <laughs> we're going to uh, move on to our next um, demo, and um, we're going to welcome Javi Blanco, um, who is going to do a, uh, demo of uh, Arthi, or more specifically, MediPremium. Yeah. Um, so it's a mobile health framework that mixes mobile instant messaging interactions with doctors, um, also an electronic health record element and some data analytics um, running in the background. Um, and MediPremium is the uh, first commercial well, version yeah. of, uh, of the app, right? Okay, um, hello, good evening, my name is Javier Lanco. Um, I'm the CEO of Hersey. Uh, Hersey is a mobile health system designed to give a reliable, universal, and affordable healthcare. Technically, Hersey is a mix. Oh, one moment. Is something not working? No, it's okay. Uh, Hersey is a mix uh, between an um, uh, instant messaging system, we got a medication other than solution electronic health records, and an internet payment service. When we designed it, Hersey, we, uh, uh, we designed it a global product. Uh, we created it for emerging markets. So Hersey is very cost effective. We can give the service for just $12 uh, dollar cents per user a month. Hersey also works on almost every Android device, also iOS, so you don't need a good smartphone to make it work. Uh, Hersey works on low bandwidth scenarios, so you don't need to have a good data plan or a good um, connection to make it work. It also has some offline functionalities, so um, the electronic health records works offline, and also the chat uh, has uh, some uh, features that make it work uh, very well in low coverage areas. Uh, also, um, many premium, the users, doesn't need to have uh, a bank account, a credit card, or even an email. Just with a valid mobile phone, it can, it, it can make it work. We can uh, make the payments with prepared cards. Uh, what I'm going to show you today is uh, our first commercial product. It's called MediPremium. MediPremium is uh, a project we made in partnership with the Spanish Health Plan. Uh, MediPremium is a tiny version of Hersey. So here you see my mobile phone. 
What you see here is uh, all the doctors available. We got uh, different specialities here. So you can chat with them. Normally, they respond in less than two minutes. Hope this works today. And you can also share files with your doctor. You can. And also, we got some additional features here. We got uh, your electronic record. This is a tiny version because hearing medi premium was not a very important feature. You got here allergies, treatments, clinical conditions, and solve problems. Uh, you got also some other features. We got here the card of the health plan, so you don't need a, 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 a physical card. This is uh, by the patient side. I, I also want to show you the doctor side of the application. So here you got the doctor's uh, interface. Its, uh, it's design is to maximize doctor's productivity. So here on the left, you got all the patients. Here on the center, you got uh, all the chats and all the messages and the photos the, um, and the archives the, uh, the patients share with the doctor. And here on the right side, you go the electronic record. A doctor can add milestones here. So he can put new allergies and whatever he wants. Uh, we, want, we, ha we have a third, um, a third role that is the, um, uh, the medical officer. Uh, we can create, with all the data we have, we can create custom dashboards. Here in MediFremium, uh, they are focused on doctor's productivity. So they want to know how many doctors are, how much time they, uh, they pass on the application, but we can uh, use all the data we gather <coughs> to make uh, um, custom dashboards with maps and disease screening, uh, whatever. It's very easy for us. All and right. that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Harry. Should I go there? Um, join us. Um, Munya, do, do you want to uh, take the opportunity to well, oh. sit here? Or my, what, this? I, I forgot there, okay. <laughs> take, yeah, take it. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. <laughs> the end of the day, everybody is tired and we need a glass of wine, no? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, no, so, so, Munya, you wanted to yeah, so, so say something. It's a very interesting product. So we, we're seeing quite a lot of these as well in, in Nairobi. So we have um, most of our partners in the peri-urban areas have no doctors close to them, actually. We, most of the clinics are, are, are actually staffed by cl uh, clinical officers, people who are not nurses, people who are not doctors, people who are not medically trained. Um, so it's quite interesting to, 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 to always see this integration that people do to connect to an to a pro actual professional who's trained, who's available to, to, to actually uh, talk to patients remotely. So have you actually tested this in, in areas where 4G or LT is not available? Oh, um, is it uh, something that people can use actually? In no, no, not really. We have been in the market for just three months here in Spain, but we are right now starting to, uh, um, to think a, in a pilot with uh, doctors with our frontiers to, uh, um, to uplead on the Middle East on, on conflictive areas. And I think we are, we are able to, uh, to give good service there. So, in fact, uh, most of the uh, emerging markets are, are having a mobile revolution. So, infrastructures, especially mobile, are not very bad. They, they are starting to go well. So, when, when, talk to, when, when talking with doctors with our frontiers, uh, they were very um, uh, interested in Syria, especially. And, uh, and Syria doesn't have a really bad connection. It's like a Mad Max scenario. So they got good technology with everything bad. But so uh, I, we, uh, we can, uh, you see, uh, next year, the uh, past year was on the Philippines, uh, in Taklovan, uh, two months uh, after a typhoon destroys it all. The first service they got was uh, internet before weather, before, the, before electricity. Uh, when you pass in the car, you see all the windows broken, but they, they, they were able to put a huge antenna. So th they got internet very, very quickly. 
just uh, six months before the typhoon came, they got a, a huge antenna with all the with connection in all the area. So I think we won't have problems in most emerging countries. Because uh, they were living, especially, you, you will know it uh, better than me, they were living, a, 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 in the internet uh, revolution is, is just mobile. You're talking now in about emergency situations, but apart from these emergency situations, you want to develop your business in, in more normal situation. So you are forecasting, what do you want to do? You want to, char to charge the patient? You want to charge who, who you will make it sustainable? Yes, uh, uh, right now in, in our first client, it's, uh, uh, the health plan pays for users. So um, it's, it's, uh, it's, use, it's uh, active user, they go to, uh, they pay us a fee. And, uh, but we are open to other, um, to other <laughs> options. <coughs> what, we really not, what, what we really want is to scale the solution up, because uh, this, this makes sense if we, can, if we could give service to millions of people. But uh, this makes sense as a service, as a business, and as an idea, as, and as a project to work for. Do you want to partner with other, do you want to partner with other? Yes. Because yes. it would be a good idea not to partner with, I don't know, people who have directories of doctor or, or patient association because you need to, to partner, no? If not, it's very difficult. Yes, we are, we are talking uh, with health plans and uh, NOGs and, uh, and uh, right now we are talking with a big corporation of Asia that has different assets to create um, a big service with them. Yeah, the only thing I would add is the one billion problem that I had shared at the beginning of my talk is not going to be solved by educating more physicians. We're not going to be able to educate enough physicians and nurses in our lifetime. Ethiopia, a population of 100 million people, there's 25 physicians, right, in the entire country. So I applaud what you're doing, and I think the more you can make this the black bag for the doctor, Think about more things you can add for that provider because they're going to be treating hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people and they're going to need to have all this integrated, you know, content should be on there. How do they get their medical resources? I would just say think broader in terms of additional things you can add on to the, um, to the device. Well, um... Don't make it just such a, in other words, what I'm saying, I wouldn't just make it a decision support tool. I would make it an informational uh, guide as well. Yes. Um, okay. Um, sorry, I, I, I didn't clean there. I, I didn't clearly I, I understood what, what you said. It's because the right operation. But um, um, right now we are working with Mendy Premium. We are gathering the first data and uh, we are trying to. Um, to, to see all the most common uh, clinical uh, conditions. And uh, later after maybe two more months, we, uh, we will try to treat it with uh, protocols. And uh, so uh, um, we will see um, if, uh, the if the conditions that this user presents can be uh, treated by a chat with an old evidence. And later we will create protocols for that. But that's, uh, that's um, uh, something we are thinking about. All right, I think we need to stop now, but thank you so much, um, Javier. And now we're going to uh, go to um, our next dem demo for this session and the last one. Um, so we have uh, Glenn Lawyer, who is going to um, sh uh, showcase HealthCast. Um, it's an app that bridges micro and macro um, data to predict um, epidemics. Am I saying it right? Okay, so thank you. So, have you ever had a cold or a flu and Google symptoms to try to understand what's going on? Well, if these common diseases cause such a burden of stress and worry, imagine when the news is full of unusual conditions like Zika, chikungunya, dengue, and one of your family members is ill? Wouldn't you be a little worried, wondering what symptoms were important, what the symptoms meant, if you're giving the right care? And it's this fundamental human need to feel competent when you're caring for the people that you love the most, 
that we're addressing and empowering. By doing this at scale, we're solving the epidemic problem, the macro problem of better epidemic surveillance, so we can actually stop the diseases in the first place. Let me show you how. So here we have a family living in Alagoas, Brazil. Rafael's been sick for a few days. Ana and the boys, they're doing pretty good. If we scroll down on the app, they can also see the disease levels in their community. The data is coming from the National Ministry of Health. We know that Rafael's been sick because Ana's been tracking his symptoms. So the fever, it's pretty mild, not too much to worry about. Rafael's been complaining about joint pain and muscle pain. Anna's worried about the red eyes, conjunctivitis, because she's never seen that before. So what she can do is uh, do a simple overlay and compare it to the typical symptoms in an adult of, for example, chikungunya, which, as you can see, will typically have a much higher fever and a much more rapid onset. And, well, the joint pain, uh, that is about similar. If she would instead compare it to dengue, she'd see that dengue is more typically characterized by muscle pain instead of joint pain and again, the high fever. Or if she looks at the Zika virus, we can see that this is actually a pretty close match to what Raphael is experiencing. And she can also see that he's probably through the worst of at least the primary symptoms, and so she, he should be back on his feet in a day or two. Now, when she's giving the care, because she wants to give the best care, we've got uh, these checklists that have been pre-populated based on standard clinical advice, knowing the conditions in the area, and knowing that Raphael is an adult. So for the morning checkup, she has a reminder it's almost due. Start up with the basic prevention information. Uh, for example, that you want to keep the patient under a mosquito net to stop further spread of the disease. And maybe because Anna has been doing this, that's why the boys are still healthy. Check symptoms. Well, we just did that. Paracetamol, uh, it's recommended by the CDC for, the, for viral fevers. And because we know Raphael is an adult, we also know that he doesn't have any other pre-existing conditions or allergies, we can just pop up the standard recommendations, 500 milligrams to one gram. And because they're using the service to track the dosages that they're giving, we can make it really easy for them to stay under the four gram per day limit. Giving fluids, the most important thing is encouraging rest. The checklist is done. There's some other things that need to happen to manage the situation, but that's all uh, organized and ready for him. And if you stop for a minute and think about what we've done here, by giving this family a tool that makes it easy for them to give best practice care, we're starting to gather records, data. This is data that is from people before they go to the doctor, data from people who don't go to the doctor, data that's invisible to traditional surveillance systems, which everything has to go through a doctor's office. And if we take this data, anonymize it, and the user has to enable sharing of the data because health data belongs to you. But now we have anonymized versions of the data. We can aggregate it. We can benchmark it against the public health data and use this to track on a map what conditions are. Even better, we can apply scientific forecasting methods to this to understand how the situation is likely to evolve in the days and weeks ahead. So the macro solution we've created is real and it's relevant. And because we've created it in a way that delivers it directly to individuals, people like you, we've made it relevant to you. Because public health works best when it's built on a foundation of empowered individuals. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Come and join us. Thank you. Who wants to react first? Yeah, so this is, this is amazing. So I, 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 do, I do like the idea of HealthCast and what it could do, what it could do in the future. Thank um, you. I, I think back to, to some of the situations that have been in Eastern Africa, in Southern Africa, uh, where people have crowdsourced information, told people about uh, activities of violence in terms of uh, uh, political crises and uh, civil wars and stuff like that. This could do the same for, for, for healthcare. Um, I think this is a great tool for epidemiology, um, and early warning is, is one of the things that we, we struggle with. So people right. don't have access to, to, to healthcare professionals close by. And when you have access to this kind of healthcare information, when you have access um, sort of for, 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 for people and what's going on around you, you can easily react, uh, either as a pharmaceutical company or uh, an NGO. Um, so it's quite interesting. So I, my, my question, though, is how do you get people to really download this app first before anything happens. I'll get yeah. the people to track this. Well, th that's one of the problems we do have to solve. But if you think about it, people are already searching for information on diseases. They're just not doing it very effectively. 
I mean, I know a lot of people that Google for symptoms and not one of them has told me they're happy with the results. So we do need to communicate it and bring it out to communities, but actually I think this adds a lot of power because we start to bring it as a community mechanism. Now we can have the, build, building the stronger communities and educating people to stop the spread of disease, the same way we've done by some of the other organizations you've mentioned for the violence and so on. It's really the community building that's going to be the win for this. Donato, you had the same kind yeah, of the reaction, question. Yeah, the same, and you know, we have done something very similar in my commercial business in okay. the United States, and I think I mentioned to you before, we have gathered 80 million mobile ID numbers. And we have done that because if they're using the pregnancy app in our platform, then we're able to extract their ID number. But the question I have, how do you scale that so that you get that data so you can extract the information out? I, I'm not... Right. Um, again, I see that as a matter of marketing. If you let people know it's there, the app is free, so there's no barrier to adoption. And it's just a matter of letting people know. I mean, could it be um, the, um, the, the fact that the app lets you compare the evolution of your symptom um, with the you know, normal evolution of the Zika symptoms? So, so it could be reassuring or it could be prompting you to go to the doctor. So it, it, it's, in a sense, it is a, some kind of diagnosing tool at the same time, so sure. could that be the incentive? Well, that could certainly be an incentive, and one of the things, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not used to pitching as a business. I like to think more of this as uh, helping people, but if you're asking this as an investor and I need to give you a marketing strategy, we're doing the disease surveillance. We know where diseases are active. We know where to focus the marketing. You can use Facebook marketing to come with extremely tight targets. There's a lot of ways we can actually communicate to people immediately to the areas of need. When you're surveying online, uh, uh, we can tell anytime somebody tweets, cold or flu, we can pick that up and we can reply to them immediately. So we can deliver it to people at the point of contact. There's a lot of ways. But yeah. So let me take my investment hat off. I think reaching out to organizations like Partners in Health, Doctors Without Borders, in many respects that's how Healthy Villages got off the ground, is that we partnered with the Robert F. Kennedy Center. And I think what you might want to do is identify those organizations that can help you scale it. I'd much rather do that, and that's actually one of the reasons I'm at this convention, is so I can make those kind of connections. Yeah. So, anybody uh, who wants to approach me either tonight or tomorrow on these topics, well, please do. I can make you uh, an introduction to Partners in Health. Yes. Um, yes. You know that Google, Google shut down flu trends, no? Right. Because they had... The, the because they screwed up the science. So, sorry? Yeah, they had a really bad algorithm. Right. They, okay. they hubris. The issue was that people could not differentiate the symptoms of a cold or of a flu. No? It was one of the big issues. At the end, it was a, a bias there. No? So how, how have you, from this experience, how, how could you teach people to differentiate their own symptoms? Because what, this is one of the problems. People, what people say, it's not always the, the reality, no? the true. No? Well, you want to keep the, give the best care you can to your family. So that's why we're, how we're collecting the data. It's as you're caring for your family. And because it takes some time to put the data in, I mean, the checkup, each individual entry is fairly easy, but it's creating the record over two or three days that starts to create the actual symptom records that we're going to start to base our forecasts on. Um, that's a pretty dedicated person to mess that up. And I really think, because a good option to widespread, because it's a brilliant idea, of course, uh, have you thought of making an API? Because at the end, the, the hub of platforms, no? Oh, yeah. This is just a delivery system. Yeah. I mean, think about it. People have been talking about health as long as we've had people. It's called small talk. Anybody ask you, how are you today, for example? Uh, so it's very easy to deliver the same thing through a voice-based system or through a chat-based system. Mm -hmm. The power is on the back end. It's the machine intelligence. It's the analytics. It's the forecasting. Anything else is uh, simply yeah. delivery. We can do it with text messages and SMSs. Yeah. Because at the end, people can have one big health app in their pocket, in their mobile, but right. many, it's when they leave the problem. Right. right. Yeah. All right. Good. Well, I think we're going to uh, close this session um, on, uh, on, on this. Um, I want to thank you guys. Um, I want to thank you, um, Glenn, for joining us. I want to thank you um, for staying. Um, we're going to have a few minutes of um, wrap-ups um, now, uh, and we are actually going to see 
um, uh, another demo, the last demo of the day, and it's going to be a demo uh, by a group of 15-year-old uh, entrepreneurs. So um, let's see what they have in store for us. But thank you again. <laughs> So, Matthew.